they them pronouns and I'm the deputy director for HRC's All Children, All Families program. Thank you so much for joining us today for HRC's National Adoption Month panel discussion. We're going to begin today by talking with national poverty and child welfare expert, David Ambrose. Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Fee Regis, I use they them pronouns and I'm the deputy director for HRC's All Children, All Families program. We're so excited to have our discussion today to celebrate National Adoption Month. November is National Adoption Month and this is an opportunity each year to bring awareness to the thousands of children in foster care that are waiting for a permanent and loving home. It's also an opportunity to bring awareness to the overrepresentation of LGBTQ plus youth in foster care. Um, some may not know that almost 30% of young people in foster care identify as LGBTQ+. So I'm really excited to have you all here today. David is a national child welfare expert and advocate. If you haven't already, I highly recommend reading A Place Called Home, David's memoir. I listened to it this weekend on Audible and I recommend that. David, your voice is incredible to listen to, I must say. Um, it is a gut-wrenching personal account of Ambrose's early life of poverty, homelessness, and foster care, where he endured physical, sexual, and emotional abuse, all of which were compounded by his sexuality. It's truly an against all odds story. David made it out, went abroad, earned a life-changing scholarship to Vassar College, and went on to graduate from UCLA School of Law. He co-founded Foster More, an organization that brings together the entertainment industry, foundations, nonprofits, and businesses to raise money for and awareness of the needs of foster children. David, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. I'm going to have to have you do my Tinder profile. <laughs> I, I can work on that. I can work on that. So we're going to dive right in. You know, we have limited time today. So as I mentioned, you know, unfortunately, LGBTQ plus youth are overrepresented in foster care. And too often, um, they are forced to stay in congregate care or, what they, or group homes, right? In a place called home, David asks readers to close their eyes and imagine a child they care about was in foster care. David, can you lead us through that exercise to help folks who are listening today understand what that experience may be like? Absolutely. Uh, I think a lot of folks often ask, what should we do? And they're looking for a specific answer. And the challenge with foster care and poverty programs in general is they're very complicated because people are messy and there is not one right answer. So what I ask people to do is exercise their empathetic muscle, their heart. And if they had to place their child, their loved one in the system, what does that system look like? And that is the answer to that question. We need to invent that now because these children are our children, not others. They belong to the state, they belong to us as a people, and we could do a better job of making sure they get to the finish line, happy, healthy, and ready. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I love what you said on your website, turning empathy into action, Yeah, right? Uh, that's really important to consider today. May have a secret tattoo that says that. <laughs> so I know you're currently a foster parent, and I'm wondering, what would you say to an LGBTQ plus person who is already interested in adoption or foster care? and maybe they're having some hesitation right now on getting started, what would you say to them? When folks walk by a homeless person on the street, I often get asked, well, what, what would you have me do? I don't think every single individual can lift up that one person. But the problem in all of our heads and our hearts is we go to this place of, I can't because. And instead, as a people, as a queer people especially, we just start with, I can do X. So if you're not ready or not able, fine. But then you decide what you can do. Maybe you can get ready. Maybe you can take the classes. Maybe you can become a CASA, a corn appointed special advocate. Maybe you could Google foster care and learn. I am running this campaign now in Foster More called Donate Your Small Talk. And the idea is, if this is fostering, what is the lowest level, lowest friction to do something? When you get in the elevator, or when you start a Zoom, and people ask you, how was your weekend? What did you have for lunch? How were your kids? No one actually cares about the answer. What if instead we talked about children? What if every time you had that small talk, you talked about this population during May, during November? 
the two months. What if we as a country centered the vulnerable in our dialogue? Everyone can do that. And then as you go up the ladder, fostering's up here. What would I say to folks? None of our families were perfect, were they? And yet here we are. And if you read my memoir, we all can do better than our parents, despite their love and everything we all aspire to be. And yet we all are become our parents, right? Don't wait for perfect. Kids don't need perfect. Kids need love. Kids need homes. And I especially think as people who have experienced otherness, we have a lot to offer uh, a population, never mind just the queer ones, all of the youth that are experiencing alienation. So don't wait for perfect. Uh, get ready to do it. And if you can't, figure out what you can do. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. I know I'm working to become a foster parent eventually, and I started by becoming a court-appointed special advocate or a CASA. That's something I highly recommend folks considering. You know, in your memoir, you do talk about sort of the spectrum, if you will, of where folks can uh, make an impact, right? Um, I know other than um, your foster parents, you talked about some sort of angels mm -hmm. in your life along the way that had, you know, an impact. And I think that's something uh, important for folks to consider as well, yeah. right? Um, that entry point, what are, what are some ways that you can be an angel uh, to a young person? Can you say a little bit about that? Absolutely. A lot of the time I felt like I was just off the side of a lifeboat, except I was in the water drowning. And there'd be moments of occasional grace when an individual would reach into the water and pull me out. And I was able to, into my lungs, and then they had to let me go for whatever reason. But without that breath, I would not be here. And that may manifest in different ways. I had uh, one particular moment I share in the book where I had very active lice and covered in bruises and rarely in school, but I was in school at this moment. And I went to the nurse's office and it was the first time I remember an adult touching me, not in violence or perversion, but with love and compassion. And she took the time, she took my hand and put it under the water and said, is this too warm? And she put my head over the sink. And if anyone has ever had lice, you know how disgusting and hard that shampoo is. And yet it stands out to me as a moment when an adult expressed love and affection in a safe way. Who would have thought 30 years later I would remember that moment? Or another teacher would slip a granola bar in my bag, my bodega bag, so that I would have food that night. Or a person when I walked by on the street begging, they would give me a dollar. Those individual moments added up to just enough to get me through. So we can't all do everything for every individual but again, it goes to what can we do? And those individuals with their occasional grace, I call my occasional angels. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. In your memoir, you also talk about different ways that folks can become foster parents uh, from emergency placements to uh, long-term placements. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of folks considering even being an emergency placement, yeah. perhaps just for the weekend or, or just an, a one night. Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. And to your earlier question, what can we individually do? It's like maybe getting married. You want to take some steps and go on some dates. A, a temporary respite foster care, where you do it for a short uh, specific period of time, could be an emergency, could just be a weekend, is an incredible way to give back. It's an incredible way to figure out if it's right for you and your family, and then you can grow. It also gives you the chance to experience different age groups that you may want to foster or different levels of need. Um, all of it is needed. The entire team is needed on the field, including folks who just do respite care or emergency placements, but all the way up to fostering. In my memoir, I talk about Holly and Steve. Yes. Holly was a boss for me as a summer camp counselor. And she saw the violence of what I was going through and fought for two years to get me into her custody. She was not a foster parent before then. And I think about the person I am today and how this woman's probably saved me. There are a million Davids in this system and we all need to step up and not wait for perfect. If it's respite care or emergency placements, awesome. If it's full fostering, terrific. If not, how can you support someone in your life that's doing it or become a CASA? Yeah, 
Absolutely. Holly even started having an impact in the memoir. Um, Holly even started having an impact on your life um, prior to becoming your foster parent. I know you talked about her taking you to Provincetown yeah. and how that had a profound impact on you uh, sort of accepting your own uh, sexual orientation. So I grew up homeless in New York City. And when I grew up, uh, it was the long, long ago of the early 80s. And I remember being in the shelter and all the shelters and all around me were men dying of AIDS. And I didn't understand or know exactly what was going on. And then I had a mom who was just patently homophobic. Um, and then I went into a foster care system that brutalized me uh, to make me less gay. By the way, unsuccessful, uh, committed homosexual. But there was a moment when I came into Holly's uh, care as a boss, she gathered up the summer volunteers and took us to Provincetown. And it was at the end of the summer, and I had never, ever seen the ocean, first of all, never mind the gay people. And then I also saw, for the first time, happy, healthy gay men. And maybe there were others there, but for me, I was gay. I was looking at the bed, and I looked around and I saw men laughing and holding and being beautiful in all their different shapes and sizes and colors. And Holly was like, and I wasn't ready to come out but she planted a seed by just being around people that were, they were okay. They were shopping, they were eating soft serve, they were going in and out of bars, and Lord knows they were wearing a lot of tank tops that barely covered anything, which I loved. <laughs> so David, I know in your memoir, you call on more LGBTQ plus people and everyone to consider becoming foster or adoptive parents. What would you say to an LGBTQ plus person who hasn't considered um, becoming a foster parent yet? What are some of the reasons, uh, uh, other than what we've shared so far, uh, that they should consider um, becoming a foster parent? I think folks have a, a particular vision of what it means to become a foster parent. Every person's journey is going to be unique. You may have a baby or a toddler. You may go for a, um, an adolescent. You're going to work with the agency to find the right person to come into your home and join your family. It's also okay to realize that it's not forever. Foster care's goal is to reunite kids with their families. Uh, Two-thirds of the kids entering foster care today are there for neglect. Neglect is a euphemism for poverty, which is a euphemism for racism. We need to understand that we're temporary care, and that is a service, and it's beautiful, and yet there are many thousands of foster children ready for adoption. So what I would say is, realize it's, it's a bit of a buffet. You're gonna be able to go up and work with your agency to find the right match for your family, whatever shape, size, or, or, or makeup your family is today. The other piece I would say is, um, as a foster dad myself, it is the most important thing I've ever done. It's the thing that has brought me the most joy and love. And candidly, I wrote the book because of my son. Uh, at least in some small measure, uh, who helped me realize that I had a lot of trauma still in me, that I thought I was past. He, my foster son, truly is the love of my life. So I would say, even though there was moments of hard and moments of struggle, at the tail end, I now have this young man in my life who I think of as my son. He's added so much value and beauty to my life, so much complication. Um, he's married and doing really well, I would say don't, don't hesitate. Go learn, go figure out. And if it's not today, that's fine. Get ready for tomorrow. I love that. I love that. You know, um, as a trans non-binary person, when I consider, you know, my road to becoming a foster parent, as I mentioned, you know, I spent some time as a CASA. And, you know, during that time, I had an opportunity to work directly um, with a young person who was trying to figure out their identity, right? And Having me in his life as a, an adult who's trans and non-binary, who's happy about it, who's accepted it, right, um, was really impactful for him. And he would constantly tell me how much, you know, having me just as an example, yeah. just, you know, just me texting him that you're fine, you're perfectly okay and healthy made such a huge impact. Um, and I think it's important for the community to recognize that you know, um, for the LGBTQ plus young people that might be in foster care, we can do a huge service to them just by being us, 
just by you know sharing the empathy that we've developed through our experiences of being othered right and even if we're you know potentially working with a, a young person who's not lgbtq plus we still most of us you know because of the rejection that we faced right and anti-lgbtq plus bias we understand what it's like to be the outsider right to be the other and and how you have to accept that and move forward right i mean that's so on point we have so much empathy from experience. Uh, I think of sympathy and empathy as cousins, but empathy is the lived experience. And so you can, you can empathize. And even if you don't happen to have a queer child as a foster parent, you have a child that's experienced something. They're there for a reason. And we have so much experience and love to give. I also think it helps us as a people that we stand up and serve our country and our, our others that are lesser than in terms of economics or what have you, we can be role models in so many ways, not just to the youth we serve, but there's a lot of baggage around being a uh, gay dad. There's a lot of baggage around being an advocate for children as a gay man. I think there's so many ways we can model behavior, but the most important thing is what you said, which is our lived experience uh, is vital to the success of these kids. We need way more. You mentioned 30%. I can tell you if they're not 30% foster parents that are queer. And that would be a beautiful thing. I absolutely agree. We're gonna switch gears just a little bit to talk about the professionals who are working in child welfare. And I know in your memoir you discuss, you know, many child welfare professionals who were not prepared at all to serve an LGBTQ plus young person and how that re-traumatized you in a very significant way. Um, can you talk about the importance of child welfare professionals being trained in best practices to serve an LGBTQ plus youth in foster care? I think the key word you said was trained. When I came through the system, I was diagnosed as gender identification disorder, GID, and the treatment was just brutal. Uh, we changed that law. I was part of that with Lambda Legal and Children's Defense Fund and Child Welfare League. It took a long time, but we changed it. However, law on paper means nothing. The practice is what matters. What are people doing on the front line? What are they measured? What are they encouraged to do? Do they have any role play or experience with it? I think my sister's a social worker, and I, I talk to her a lot. People go into other people's circumstances and homes in the most intimate moment of crisis, and we then maybe pull the child out. And meanwhile, these people, mostly women that do this work, what are they experiencing? What do they know? Where are they from? Do they have the empathy and learned knowledge about dealing with trans youth, queer youth? In my experience, not enough. And that's all right, because we're gonna change that. Yeah. So I think the commitment to not just passing good law, but making sure that we put it into practice and not just as a mandate, but as training and engagement and role play, it's vital. Um, because, you know, I have New Year's goals from last year. They're very cute, they're on paper. The reality is, if we want it lived, if we want people to change in terms of their ability to serve a population, we've got to do the work. And organizations like HRC, but also um, state agencies, local county agencies, need to commit to do that work. And it's not one and done. You gotta keep at it, just like going to the gym or saving for retirement. You just gotta keep, keep putting that money in the bank because um, you're gonna wanna draw on it, especially in a moment of crisis that you have that muscle memory of how best to serve these youth or these families. Yeah, absolutely. And All Children, All Families, um, HRC's program that works with adoption and foster care agencies, that's something that is really important to us. You know, we really uh, emphasize training um, on best practices in serving LGBTQ plus youth and LGBTQ plus parents. Um, we have uh, free webinars that any child welfare professional can access at any time, right? Um, so folks who are child welfare professionals who need that training, they can come directly to our program and get that for free um, you know, at any time that's convenient for them. Um, so on a similar note, I'm curious you know, what you can share with folks about the importance of child welfare agencies assessing foster parents for their readiness to provide safe and affirming homes to an LGBTQ plus youth. 
I think the match that you're referencing between youth and parent, it's a very interesting um, process. I've always thought about it as one-sided Tinder. You have one party who's completely empowered to decide whether or not to have a forced marriage. <laughs> and a lot of the times the kid is baby consulted, but the younger and younger they are, the less consulted they are. That's not right. We need more of a balance. We need um, uh, a family that is ready to take in the child as they are. And that is vital. And the child needs to understand that too, that they're uh, co-equal in this relationship, not an arranged marriage that who knows it'll work out. I think it's vital. Um, the parties are equally empowered. I too often was forced into homes that, to say that they did not share my values was an understatement. Um, they were fundamentally opposed to my very existence. And that's not going to create a good place for them nor myself. And that's why I think more queer people need to be stepping up to do this work, not just to take care of the children that happen to be, but all children. So I think the, the role of the parents, diverse set of foster parents, I talk about it all the time, are adoptive parents, vital. We need more of us to step up and raise our hand to be in the service. I was reading a statistic that uh, 8.4 million children in America live in poverty. More than half of our schools are Title I, which is free lunch. If the kids are at school having free food because they're hungry, what are the parents eating? We have so many problems right in front of us, and while we can't individually solve them all, all of us can do something. And that's to your point about empathy to action. It's my whole message of this book. I think foster parents, adoptive parents, vital and key role. And if you find the problem in the system, fix that problem. Uh, too often I hear it's too hard to adopt out of foster care. Okay, change it. Organize, change it, fight for the kids that will come for the next hundred years. Let's fix it. And that's what I'm trying to do with my memoir as well. Share my story, move people, fix it. Absolutely, absolutely. And as we come to a close here, David, I'd love for you to share anything that you'd like with the audience as we close about your book, about Foster More, anything that you'd like for folks to know. I hope folks will pick up my book. A uh, place called home. It's available everywhere, including where I work, Amazon. Um, and the reason I hope people pick it up is twofold. One, because it's a good read or listen. But second, what I tried to do throughout the whole memoir was never put anyone on, on blast, never persecute folks in the system that maybe shouldn't have done what they did. I don't condemn the foster parents that hurt me or the social workers who did perhaps not ideal service because we're all acting in a system that's imperfect. And what I wanted to do is not to persecute Frankenstein, but to go and embrace the system and bring people with me so that folks like my sister who are doing their best job as a social worker are supported to do social work instead of paperwork. I think there's such a vital shift we need to make. And the way that we do it is storytelling with each other. That's how we move people. Not by facts or badgering people with facts, but by sharing our story. Uh, the softest part I felt, the hardest part, was sharing a lot about the things that happened because I was a gay kid. And I hope, especially this community and those that support us, um, read that. And that part of them gets even deeper and more committed. For Foster More, Foster More is an effort. It has a lot of uh, agencies, state, county, federal. The idea is, like breast cancer, how do we go from an issue that is not talked about that half the species thinks is not their problem, to where we are today. Foster more is an effort to take foster care and adoption on that journey. So for instance, in my memoir, I, I start the afterword with a list of famous foster and adopted youth, Steve Jobs, Marilyn Monroe, Coco Chanel, Willie Nelson, Nelson Mandela, Maya Angelou. We need to rebrand this topic to show the beautiful potential of these young people so I hope people not only feel the feels, but read the afterward. And if you're not gonna foster adopt, you call your county or your assembly person or your senator and be like, are you putting this afterward into practice? Because this is a great policy paper. And I hope they do that. I, I couldn't agree more. And you know, 
aside from you know the feels that you talked about in the memoir, there are also a lot of laughs as well. Yes. <laughs> uh, I enjoyed, uh, I listened to it uh, on an audio book and I loved the portions where you were singing uh, some of the songs that you learned and talking about your uh, desire to be on the stage. Um, that was really amazing. Did you maybe share that desire? Absolutely, 100%, <laughs> and I miss the stage currently, but we're working on that. Well, thank you so much for your time here today, David. I really enjoyed our conversation. We're going to be heading into the next portion of our conversation for National Adoption Month now. All right, thanks again to David Ambrose for helping us open up our panel discussion today. We're going to be celebrating LGBTQ plus folks who have become foster adoptive parents. We're going to be talking about LGBTQ plus youth who were adopted and celebrating that journey. And we're going to be talking about child welfare professionals across the country who are committed to providing support to the LGBTQ plus community. So let's begin our discussion today. Let's dive right on in. I am joined today by Luis and Glenn Gonzalez Contreras. Both of them use he, him pronouns. They are adoptive parents who've been supported by one of our longest partners over 10 years, Adoptions Together in Maryland. Welcome, Luis and Glenn. Hi, thank you for having us. Hi, Fid. All right, next up, we have Candace and Justine DeMazzo. Both of them use she, her pronouns. They are foster adoptive parents from TLC Child and Family Services in California. Thank you so much for joining us today, Candace and Justine. Thanks for having us. Thank you. All right. And then our last panelist, but certainly not least, is Katie Winan. She uses she, her pronouns. She's an adoption social worker and LGBTQ plus advocate from PACT and Adoption Alliance, another All Children, All Families partner who's committed to LGBTQ plus inclusive policies and practices. Thank you so much for joining us today, Katie. Happy to be here. All right. So let's get started. In my discussion with David Ambrose, we discussed the importance of LGBTQ plus folks considering becoming foster or adoptive parents. So I'm curious, to our panelists today, I'd like to start by asking, why do you think LGBTQ plus folks make great foster or adoptive parents, right? What have you learned on that journey that shows you how your identity has, you know, really helped you along the way and helped Im impact the young person that you're supporting? So we will start with Candace and Justine. Sure, so for me, I feel there's a innate understanding that everyone is a unique person, that we all come from different walks of life um, and respect the fact that we will process situations as an individual without fitting into a specific format. Um, as a community, we embrace, encourage, and support being open-minded. And for me, these are several key attributes um, for being a successful guardian or a parent Absolutely. Justine, anything you'd add to that? Um, I think that we also uh, force others around us and other families to kind of redefine the word family um, in that there's not necessarily always going to be a mom and a dad. And that's a good thing. That's it, it, making the world a better place. Absolutely. Luis and Glenn, love to hear what you think about that. Sure. I mean, I think that LGBTQ people make, you know, great foster and adoptive parents because we're part of a community that has overcome so many challenges and, you know, that give us the ability to connect in a deeper level, um, you know, with the struggles that the kids in foster care system might have experienced in the past. And also that allows us to, to support and understand their individualities and celebrate them. Absolutely, absolutely. Anything else that you'd like to add there? Yeah, um, I can add that as LGBTQ plus community, we, most of us choose our own family. Um, and uh, going through that, process allow, allow us to understand as well what the kids on foster care are going through. So I think that that is a huge uh, advantage that we have because we can understand them. Absolutely. I completely agree. Katie, I know you're bringing a little bit of a different lens here, right, as a, the professional who is on the call, right? So can you share some success stories maybe from working with LGBTQ plus folks um, who have adopted a young person from care? Yeah, 
It's exactly what everyone has said. I think a lot of LGBTQ plus people have experienced loss, trauma, um, might have been asked, their family might have said, you need to leave, right? They've experienced a lot of this. So youth in foster care, loss, trauma, <laughs> might have been asked to leave. So exactly like you all said, um, they, you already just kind of know what's going to happen or you just have lived experience that will help the youth. And the youth that I've worked with that are adopted um, by LGBTQ led families are just, I don't, the kids are all right. Like it really is. I know that movie was years ago and there's probably problematic stuff, but the kids are all right. The families are great. And then a lot of youth, if they're adopted earlier or younger age where they don't know their sexual orientation or identity yet, they're then held in a home that is letting them explore that. And that's what I've seen. I've seen a lot of youth right around eight to 13 that are suddenly like, I wanna try this pronoun, I wanna do this, I wanna explore this. And their LGBTQ plus parents are like, yep, let's do it. And they don't face the same discrimination or possible removal from the home that they might experience with a cishet couple. Absolutely. So many great points in there. Um, so we're going to continue with um, sharing the best part of your foster or adoption experience. I want to hear what have been some of the great successes along that journey, any milestones that you'd like to share. And we're going to start with Luis and Glenn. So um, milestones, there have been many. I think when it comes to uh, uh, the adoption process, um, our adoption process was very challenging. And the moment that we had the kid in our house was a huge uh, milestone and a very happy moment for our family. Um, also, when we got to finalize the adoption was also a very good feeling uh, because we find he, uh, our child is from Salt Lake City, Utah, and we were able to travel to Salt Lake City to uh, finalize the adoption over there and uh, it was like closing the cycle for him um, but I think that one of our biggest uh, moments that make us more proud of this process is uh, seeing our son exploring what he wants and not supporting him. Uh, our son he's currently 14 years old and he has done soccer, basketball, ballet, um, cooking, everything. And I think he's exploring without boundaries and being able, he was in a very restrictive conservative foster home before us. And right now he's testing all those limits and being able to explore and all the different parts of, of the spectrum, I think that is very um, rewarding for us as a parent. And it's something that we didn't have when we were his age and being able to do that for him is actually very, very rewarding. I love that. I absolutely love that. Anything else that you'd like to add there? I mean, I, I completely agree with, with, it's the same journey, uh, but I would add that um, the very first moment when we, met him was very special as well um so i think that's a that's a uh a, a memory that will stay in 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 our core and i i believe it's very special for him as well so it's something that the three of us share and it's it's just uh it's unforgettable unforgettable i love that i can only imagine i can only imagine i'm waiting for the day when i have that same experience looking forward to it uh, Candace and Justine, anything you'd like to add there? Best part of your foster adoption experience so far? Yeah, I think we agree. I think that the the best has to be the adoption day. It's it was a long time coming for us. Uh, we we had a foster uh, situation for a year and a half um, before then, and then we had dealt with infertility for two years before that. So there was a lot of emotions that day. Um, for everyone uh, because of the process. Um, but I also want to add that I think that our, or what we've learned the most throughout this process or the best part about this process is children are so resilient. Um, and to see that 
in the foster adoption process and just the foster process in general. Um, we have placements that come in, you know, come into our family and they are, they haven't necessarily met the milestones that they should have at the age that they are. Um, but you play with them a lot, you read them books, um, you show them love and care and attention, and they can quickly get ahead of the game. And I think that's what has kept us fostering, um, even though we don't necessarily need to adopt anymore. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. Anything you'd like to add there? It was well said, I've got nothing else. <laughs> All right, uh, Katie. Again, love to hear your thoughts there. Any success stories that you can share about LGBTQ plus youth that were adopted from CARE? Um, I would say the biggest success is permanency for a lot of them, especially if they're older. Once a kid is past the age of two, <laughs> they're not as appealing um, within the foster care system. So real success to me as a social worker uh, and child welfare advocate is a youth finally getting permanency. Um, and then for those that are LGBTQ identified to be placed in a home that's LGBTQ identified is like, I have permanency, I have representation, I have people who get it. Um, and that's just completely different than youth that are still bouncing around, might not be in a home where they're welcomed or supported. Um, and then I worked with a youth this summer who is exploring the possibility of transitioning and they have queer parents. And it was just, as a 40 year old woman, it's like seeing where the youth are today, seeing the support that they're getting, working with our little kids that are like four and five that just casually say, no, I have two daddies. I'm better than you because I have two daddies and you only have one, right? Like these little kids are saying this, it's so commonplace for them to be like, oh, you have two moms, me too. Like that's, that's just what they do. They're like, me too. And then they keep it moving. And to me, that is such a success from the childhood I grew up in. Unfortunately, there are still youth that don't get this experience, but things are changing. And to me, that is success. Absolutely, absolutely. Katie, can I ask you something? You mentioned permanency. Can you help uh, define that for folks who may not be familiar with that term? Sure. Um, so within the foster care system, like I said, kind of the age of two, becomes less appealing. I think a lot of people really want a baby or a clean type of slate. So older children are often bouncing around. They don't have permanency. They don't have a solid home. They carry that kind of like garbage bag or suitcase of things because they're, okay, I'm getting ready for my next home. Um, I have a couple friends who were adopted from foster care, right? And they were like, I'd sit in school, see my caseworker come in and I'd know, all right, I'm switching to another school. I don't have permanency. Once they find a home, and if reunification is not possible and then they are adopted, that's their permanency. And that is huge for a lot of foster youth, especially those that are older. Yeah. Did that I, cover it? It did. It did. Okay. <laughs> and something in there I think tied really well into what Candace and Justine just added, you know, about sort of folks wanting uh, that blank slate. You know, and what Candace and Justine sort of uh, just mentioned, if I, if I heard it correctly, was sort of the, the power of reparenting right? Uh, the ability for uh, sort of you to help that young person experience some of the things that they may not have when they were younger, right? And helping to really build that um, level of almost helping them experience their childhood again, if you will. Um, Candace, interesting. Do you think I got that right? Is that what you were saying? Oh, yes. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I'm curious if folks can share one thing they wish they knew um, about the foster adoption process before joining. Um, you know, just one sort of golden nugget, if you will, that we'd like to leave folks with. Um, I'm going to start with um, Katie there. Uh, you know, any encouraging information about the potential of uh, young people that you see that are adopted out of foster care? Yes, uh, I think the potential for youth adopted from foster care kind of comes back to the permanency for me. They have permanency, they have a family, they're no longer bouncing around. I think um, youth coming out of the foster care into LGBTQ homes, representation is also really important for them to know other LGBTQ families who have adopted youth from foster care. That's one thing I've seen in my work with youth is 
if there's a family that looks like them, it just, it helps it. They're like, okay, I'm not the only, a lot of times adopted kids think they're the only adopted kid in the world, which we know is not true. <laughs> um, so seeing other LGBTQ headed families is really important to them. And I remember meeting a young kid who was in the foster care system and somebody, I think his worker talked to him about, there's a potential family for you. It's two dads. And the kid was like, no, no, I don't no, I don't want that. And then they went to this kind of like meet and greet thing. And the kid saw another kid from the residential center with a two dad family. And all it took was the kid who first said no to see the love, the support, the connection. And after that, like meet and greet thing, kid went up to their worker and said, okay, I'd like to meet a two dad family too. So seeing it will definitely help youth that might be like, mm, I don't know. And in order to see it, we need more LGBTQ headed families um, being welcomed by foster and adoption agencies. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, Luis and Glenn, uh, one thing you wish you knew about the process before you got started. Um, I think that one of the things that we would have liked to know is that um, there is not much more uh, representation or inclusion for LGBTQ plus uh, families, especially when adopting from foster care. Um, there is uh, a lot of mis misconception, as I mentioned before, and uh, I wish that I knew more, or that we knew more about uh, these type of challenges, so we knew how to face them. Great, great. Uh, Candice and Justine? I think for us, it was um, overwhelmingly to be patient with how long the process actually can take from <laughs> A to Z. Um, your social worker can warn you a million times, but there are defined uh, time frames that months or weeks, how whatever it may be, that have to happen in between certain steps, but then you don't account for holidays, for the court being backed up, for sick days, for personal vacations, right? Those kind of things. Um, so remaining patient and supportive and being hyper aware of um, the emotions in your household and being there for each other are super important. All right. Wonderful. All right. Well, we're going to switch gears slightly here. Um, I would like for folks to uh, add, uh, why is it important for child welfare professionals to be trained on best practice on best practices in supporting L uh, LGBTQ plus parents? Um, Katie, let's start with you. Um, I'd love to know why was it important to you? Why was it important to PACT, your organization? Well, for PACT, we are a child-centered organization. And for us, we're looking for families for children, not children for families. So to us, a family is a single or a two-parent home that can provide and love and support and give permanency. It didn't matter to us whether it was two men or two women. And we had to recognize we need to have appropriate language. We need to be respectful. As a member of the LGBTQ community myself, um, I hopped onto the HRC, All Children, Are All Families training. It's been so valuable when going into homes for home study, um, going into homes for post placement. Uh, my family and I work with a bunch of LGBTQ plus families and they they're awesome. Some of them have been my favorite families <laughs> that I'm always like, oh, I can't wait till you're placed because you're just going to be amazing for your kid. Um, and we it's also extremely important in, in my line of work as well. I've worked with pregnant people in the last two years who have said to me, I want an LGBTQ plus family for my kid. Um, I, I always say there are cishet families that might not kick them out, will be just as welcoming. And they're like, yeah, I get that. And I want an LGBTQ plus family for my kid. Um, there was one uh, pregnant woman that we worked with who she was not queer identified, but she spent time unhoused on the streets. And a lot of the youth that she came across were queer identified who had been kicked out of the foster care system. So she was like, they were all with hetero families. I want my kid to go to a queer family. Uh, so it's just really important to be prepared. We need families. We desperately need families. So why would we cut out thousands of totally qualified, wonderful human beings? 
I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, <laughs> Luis and Glenn, uh, we'd like for you to pick up on that. Why is it important that the child welfare professionals that you work with are trained on uh, best practices in serving LGBTQ plus parents? Anything that you'd like to share there? Yes, of course. Um, I think that especially knowing uh, how, what are our own challenges and it, it allows to make easier the, the process for us as well. Um, one thing that is, uh, that is very important is to get to know, especially when doing the, the, the home study, uh, we were asked questions that were very uncomfortable for us and that we were very sure that a heterosexual couple would not be asked for. And uh, that made us feel um, very uncomfortable. Also going through the process, um, we had to face and learn things that um, we were not prepared for. Uh, because of the interactions with other agencies um, and with the child's team. So I think that if we train these professionals that are around the children that are in foster care, it allows uh, to make the process much easier for everyone involved. Yes, yes. And I know you mentioned you worked with a number of different agencies along the way. Uh, I know, you know, most recently you've been working with Adoptions Together, one of our longtime partners. I'm wondering if you can share, you know, maybe how that experience was different um, from the other uh, organizations that you worked with. So uh, we've always worked with uh, Adoptions Together. Um, they have been our uh, main agency, but then we have the state agencies that they have the guardianship of the child. And those are the interactions that have been um, more challenging for us. Adoption together has been great because uh, this is a group of professionals that uh, advocate for the best interests of both the child and the families and they are very well prepared and trained. They have a lot of resources, especially for LGBTQ plus families. Um, they offer a lot of counseling to uh, us as uh, adoptive parents to navigate the process. Um, however, when it comes to interacting with other uh, state agencies, that's when things get more complicated. Um, when uh, when you are through the mashing process, it's you can get in touch with people that still have a, a lot of uh, misconceptions about LGBTQ plus. Um, some of these kids are in uh, very rural areas uh, in uh, uh, very conservative states, and uh, they don't have the the they don't have the right conception of what LGBTQ plus people are and what, what we can bring to the table for these kids. So um, if we had this type of training or education for this professional, then we can uh, have better results through that matching process. Wow, wow. Candace and Justine, I'm going to turn to you in just a moment. I just want to dig a little bit deeper there. I know you mentioned you've had some challenging experiences with these other agencies outside of Adoptions Together. What inspired you or what pushed you to keep moving with the process? Um, I know sometimes it can be discouraging, you know, when you experience forms of anti-LGBTQ plus bias and discrimination. Why did you keep going? Well, um, First, we already knew the child and uh, we fall in love with him. Uh, this is a child that uh, wanted to be adopted and he demonstrated from day one that he wanted us as his parents. Um, there were a lot of conflict of interest around. There were um, a lot of uh, sabotage. Um, all, all the way to the very last minute. 
And uh, it was the child who uh, allowed us to keep pushing through. And, uh, and also in his own way, he was trying to explain his side of the story and what was going on and giving us hints here and there. And when we realized that there was something major going on, that's when we kept pushing and pushing and pushing on all the way to the placement and then uh, finalization of the adoption. Yes. Thank you for sharing that. Anything else you'd like to add there before we move to Candace and Justine? Oh, I just wanted to add that uh, we also wanted to, to make sure that he knew that we were going to be there for him because this is something that he didn't have before. He was, you know, uh, in different foster um, homes and he never, he never had that uh, permanency that um, Katie was talking about. So that was something that was really, was really important for us to, to show him. I love that. I love that. All right, Candice and Justine, thanks for bearing with me there. All right. I, I'm, I'm curious what you'd like to add there. Uh, why do you think it's important uh, for child welfare professionals to be trained on best practices in serving LGBTQ plus parents? Any experiences that you've had there that you'd like to share? I, I think it ultimately is what the others are saying is that with especially this day an age where kids are having the opportunity to experience finding their identity earlier and earlier on in life. Um, why not have those there that are that know what that struggle looks like or might look like? Why not have them be a part of it? You know, it's a it's an invaluable um, guidance and experience that we can offer them. Yeah, yeah. I'm curious. Did you all experience, you know, uh, anything challenging along the journey related to your LGBTQ plus identity? Um, any sort of uh, success stories, if you will, that you can share from your time working with TLC? Um, we've had a, a, an amazing experience with TLC. I actually, in fact, do not um, say anything about our adoption process without adding them in it. Um, they have been welcome, welcoming from the beginning. It seems like they do all of the training and they are very inclusive. Um, so I, I, I wouldn't do it without them and don't suggest others <laughs> doing it without a without a organization that is inclusive and open-minded and open-minded and always felt welcome with them yeah yeah i'm curious you know how do you think it would have impacted your journey if that wasn't the case uh you know wh what do you think that experience would have been like it so from what I can read from other like other agencies like Luis and Glenn were talking about, it feels cold. Um, whereas with TLC and the social workers that we are involved with through that agency, they feel warm. They, they um, I don't know how else to describe it. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's a great it's very possible that after our first placement, it, you know, our our journey very well could have ended there if it was a different scenario for us. We ended up becoming emergency foster parents, um, guardians, and we're now looking like we're in the adoption process again, and we had no intentions of doing such. So, <laughs> um, so I think, yeah, it's, it's been an amazing experience with, with who we have, the agency we have, and the it could have been drastically different otherwise. Yeah, there are two things you said there that I wanna dive a little bit deeper on. You mentioned becoming emergency foster parents. Uh, some folks uh, who are joining us may not be familiar with what that means. Can you share? Yeah, so the quick of it is, is that when kids are pulled um, from the home at any given minute, you can be that phone number that your agency can call at 6 a.m., at midnight, at 2 a.m., whenever and say, hey, um, we have one kiddo, we have two kiddos, we don't even know their names, we don't know how old they are, are you willing to take them in? Wow, and what makes you willing to do that? Like, can you share a little bit about that? For, for me, I remember when we went through the first training process, um, they talked a lot about trauma when kids are pulled from each kind of 
people that they were attached to. Um, and so each time they're taken away, even if they're very young, um, each time they're taken away from their caregiver, that creates a new trauma to them. So being an emergency family can possibly uh, decrease the amount of traumas that they have in their early childhood. Um, yeah, so that's absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And the, and the second part, really quick, that I want to dig on, I know we're getting uh, almost close to wrapping up here. Um, I know you mentioned you're, you're almost, if you will, accidentally becoming uh, adoptive parents again. How does that happen? Um, what, what is, you know, sort of inspiring you to, to go on that journey again? I, I think um, it was the specific child that kind of grabbed a spot in our heart. Um, so it was, it was different. And that's the, one of the cool things about this journey also is that, you know, all the kids are very different um, and you can find attachment, you know, more so um, and specific things that grab you about certain kiddos. And you just, when it, there's a right fit, you can feel it. Yeah. I love that. I love that. All right. What an amazing conversation. I, I really want to thank you all who have joined us today. Thank you to our speakers as we close, let us remember the urgent need for more foster or adoptive parents and for child welfare professionals to support the LGBTQ plus community. HRC's All Children, All Families program is here to support. We have a map of LGBTQ plus inclusive agencies around the country, like PACT, uh, Adoptions Together and TLC Family Services that we've talked about today, right? There are plenty more around the country that you can take a look at. And there are also resources for child welfare professionals that need to learn how to best support the LGBTQ plus community. So we're here to support. Thank you all again for joining today and we'll see you next time. Take care.